perfect. Um, so my name is Sean Fitzgerald. I am a staff member with the JDRF Indiana team. Uh, we are so thankful for all of you who are able to join us today. Um, this is a webinar as part of our ongoing virtual connections uh, program. So we have a number of these in the past. We've done one related to type 1 diabetes and COVID-19. We've done one on T1D advocacy. So if you haven't already, um, suggest taking a look at um, our virtual connections uh, website um, and um, certainly encourage you all to look at some of those past recordings. This one will be added to it after the fact if you want to share with any of your friends. All those are YouTube videos after the fact. Um, JDRF Indiana um, thanks you for your continued support for our mission and just again really want to thank you for joining us today as we learn a little bit more about um, obviously JDRF's larger research efforts but also some of the very uh, very cool, very interesting research going on in our own backyard with, uh, with Matt. So, um, as always, um, we are here, uh, our chapter oversees um, the entirety of Indiana. And so, if you ever have any questions, if you're looking for ways to engage, we're always available. Um, we have some really exciting um, upcoming virtual opportunities. Um, this upcoming Saturday is our virtual walk. Um, we'll have a video presentation uh, in the morning, so keep an eye out for that. And we invite you to watch that presentation and you know, have an opportunity to um, have a walk kind of feel and a walk day from the comfort of your own home. And then on Saturday, May 30th, um, we unfortunately had to cancel our, our in-person gala, um, but we will be having a virtual gala. And the nice thing about that is I can put a tux on on the top half and wear sweatpants on the bottom half. So, um, but if you have never been to the JDRF gala, this is a great opportunity for you to still bid on silent auction items or um, take part in some of the festivities. So really encourage you to engage with us on Saturday, May 30th. Um, for that as well. So uh, without further ado, we'll uh, start diving into some of the content. Um, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, again, this will be recorded and so available for you after the fact. Um, so uh, this will be put on YouTube and also onto our Virtual Connections uh, webpage where all our webinar recordings are. Um, I kindly ask all of you to please mute yourself um, until the question and answer session, probably during, I, I would guess, about the last 15 minutes or so um, of, uh, of our allotted time. Um, we will try and be pretty respectful of all of your time and, and so keep it uh, uh, under that hour for you all. Um, the, uh, and then finally, if you want to um, put yourself on video when you get to the question and answer, when you're chatting, that's great as well. We really want to encourage kind of that, that interactive component as well um, for you all later. Um, I will be monitoring the chat box. So if you do have a question that comes up as we're going through the presentation, you know, something that John or Matt uh, might mention, throw it in the, the chat section. Um, if possible, I might interject or or let them know you know if there's a, a particular question that that might be pertinent to where they are otherwise we can bring it up during the question and answer session so feel free to use that that chat function finally the the last component i want to touch on is J, jdrf's um covid19 response we have made the decision to cancel all in-person events through june 30th um this has resulted in uh, a number of walks, galas, a lot of revenue uh, generating items being uh, and events being canceled. Um, and so type 1 diabetes didn't go anywhere. Um, it's still continued um, through this pandemic as I'm sure everyone on this call uh, knows all too well. Um, and so JDRF's mission likewise is, is as crucial as ever. And so we just want uh, all those on this call or all those who might watch this recording after to know that um, we're still, as always, looking for uh, your support, your friend's support, all those types of things through uh, our virtual events that are upcoming. 
So without further ado, um, I want to introduce our featured speakers today. Um, so we have um, the absolute um, great opportunity to hear from uh, two great researchers. Um, so John, John is with uh, JDRF, he's a senior scientist, and uh, so thankful for him to uh, be with us talking a little bit about JDRF's overall um, research priorities. Um, and then Matt, Matt uh, is again our researcher here in Northern Indiana in our own backyard at, at uh, the University of Notre Dame. And obviously um, so great to hear from him. He was just awarded a JDRF grant recently. So I think he'll really be able to give um, some really cool insight into uh, some of his research. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to John to uh, take it away. So thank you both for, for joining us today. Thanks, Sean, for the nice introduction. First, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me right now. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. I always get excited to do these events um, because it's so much fun to teach people about what we do at JDRF and research. And I've gotten a lot of feedback that people are really interested to learn about it. So I mean, where I'll start is, is with the question, what do scientists at JDRF do? I mean, obviously we support research for type one, but what do we do day to day? And the answer is that we partner. Um, there is no lab at JDRF. We don't wear lab gloves. We don't do experiments ourselves. What we do is we find the best opportunities we can all over the world, and we fund them and we partner with them. This is academics like Dr. Weber, who's going to speak after me. It's also companies, biotechs, pharmaceutical companies, even governments. Um, anyone with an interest in pursuing a good, good project to get a cure or a therapy for type 1 we'll consider partnering with them to move it forward. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so even though the R in JDRF stands for research, we actually do so much more at JDRF. So what this slide shows is a cartoon of all the steps that, that have to take place from a drug developer having an idea in his chemistry lab, all the way up to people with type one actually benefiting from a drug or a device. Um, you start with discovery research, then you do clinical trials, um, then you need to get approval from the FDA, you need to get payers to cover your medication, and you need to get people to actually wanna take the drug. And JDRF handles all of this. In addition to funding research from you know, basic science all the way up to clinical trials, we also have experts um, in our office in Washington, D.C who are uh, pros at regulatory affairs who interact with the FDA. We also have experts in a policy office who interact with government payers and insurance companies. We have sort of all the in-house expertise in addition to science to actually bring drugs and devices and therapies to market. And we work um, with our partners to make sure this happens. Next slide, please. So this is what we call our research paradigm. Our research can be basically divided into two categories. One we call curing type one diabetes, without a doubt, that's the holy grail, that's the highest mission, is to get a cure for this thing. At the same time, we'll never forget people who already have type one diabetes, and in a sense, wouldn't benefit from a cure um, because they're already living with this disease. And for those people, we have a whole program dedicated to getting better drugs and devices and therapies to ameliorate the symptoms of type one and allow people uh, to live healthier and easier day-to-day -day lives. So I'm gonna start by telling you about some of the really exciting research we're doing in our curing program, and that's on the next slide. So um, this is gonna be a tiny bit of a biology lesson before I go to show you some of the stuff we work on. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune disorder, and like all autoimmune disorders, this means that your immune cells, which are supposed to be hunting down germs in your body, get confused for some reason, which we don't fully understand. And in the case of type one, they attack the beta cells in your pancreas instead of germs. Um, beta cells in your pancreas are critical because they produce insulin, which you need to keep your blood sugar down. And so um, as a result of immune cells attacking your beta cells, you can no longer make your own insulin. And that's why people with type one have to take shots every day. So all of that said, there are sort of two broad ways we can cure type one. We can either do something to put the brakes on the immune attack, 
and protect your beta cells that way. Or we can directly target the beta cells to protect them from the immune system. And ultimately, what we're going to do is both to get the best possible benefit. Um, that'll come tomorrow. But what we have today is really good clinical trial results for each of those approaches individually. And I'm going to show you one on the next slide. This is one of the most exciting things that's ever happened at JDRF and in type 1 research. This is a clinical trial of a drug called teplizumab, which is one of the immune agents that I was sort of hinting at. This is a drug that puts the brakes on your immune system, not in a general way that leaves you prone to infection like what you get with uh, after a transplant or something. This is more of a targeted approach. It's a scalpel, not a hammer, to prevent your immune system from attacking beta cells but leave it intact um, to provide defense against germs. So I'm gonna talk us through this graph for a moment. So this is a clinical trial where a large number of people were selected who didn't have type one, but were at high risk for type one. This means people who had family members with type one and had uh, been screened for autoantibodies, which indicated that they were at high risk of progressing to type one diabetes in the near future. So a large group of people who fit that category were selected and they were uh, randomized to either the drug teplizumab or the placebo. And simply put, the trial went on for several years and kept track of how many people were diagnosed with type one in each group. And obviously the hypothesis is that if this drug really does prevent the immune system from attacking your beta cells, then people who receive the drug should progress to type one diabetes um, at a lower rate than people who got the placebo. And this is exactly what it shows. So the graph on the y-axis, it's percentage of people free of type one. So for both groups, it starts at 100%. And then over time, they go down each at their own rate. And what you can appreciate is that for people who received the placebo, they got a type one diagnosis earlier and at a greater rate. In fact, when all the statistics were sort of done, what we found is that people who received the drug teplizumab stayed type 1 diabetes free for a median of two more years compared to placebo. And um, this work was done by Dr. Kevin Harold at Yale. And when I heard him present it, he used a phrase I really liked. He sort of asked rhetorically, what's the value of two years free of type 1 diabetes? And, and his, his answer, which I liked so much, was two years without diabetes is a gift. Uh, it's a starting point. It's not the end goal. The end goal is a lifetime free of type 1. But as a first pass, the, this is truly a gift for people who can benefit from it. Two years without type one means a lot, especially for young people in middle school or high school, fresh off to college. Um, but again, this is a starting point and we're gonna work to expand it. Um, this is the first time in history anyone did a clinical trial and showed that any approach could delay the onset of type one diabetes. So this was truly a special landmark. Can you go to the next slide, please? I also want to use this um, bit of research as an example of all the things JDRF does to move projects forward. Of course, this clinical trial didn't come out of nowhere. It was based on earlier research, and that had been supported by JDRF, both earlier animal studies with the drug and earlier clinical studies. Um, JDRF advocates worked to get, to get the Special Diabetes Program funded, which provided funds for an organization called TrialNet, which supported the trial. JDRF has a venture capital arm called the T1D Fund, which is currently investing in a company called Provention Bio, which actually owns the Teplism of Asset and is moving it forward. Um, right now, they're enrolling another large clinical trial, and JDRF is helping out in addition to the funding by interfacing with the FDA. We need to educate the FDA about what a regulatory path looks like for a drug like this, since no one has ever seen one that can do this. And we also need to teach the company what the FDA will be expecting, all of this toward the goal of smoothing the transition from promising clinical trial results um, to actual pharmacies. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so that was, um, I wish I had more time, I wish I had an hour to talk about this, but that was sort of a quick highlight of one of our really exciting cures. And now I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the second category I mentioned, improving lives. As I said, we recognize um, you know, if you already have type one, it might be too late to block your immune system from killing your beta cells. And that's why we have an extensive um, portfolio 
to improve lives of people who already have it. Um, this includes glucose control therapies. That's drugs like new and better insulins, um, devices, artificial pancreas devices, better CGMs, and what we call adjunctive therapies, which are drugs that you take along with insulin in order to improve outcomes beyond what insulin by itself can provide. We also have a portfolio in complication projects. This is eye and kidney disease, as well as psychosocial disease, since we understand um, the, the psychological burden um, faced by people with type one and their loved ones. And next slide, please. And I think, um, yes. So I just want to highlight uh, one particular therapy we work on, and, and Dr. Weber is gonna be talking about this as well. So I mentioned adjunctive therapies. This is a drug you take along with insulin. Um, the reason we need adjunctive therapies is, is very straightforward. Everyone on this call already knows what the epidemiological data tell us, which is that insulin by itself isn't good enough. Uh, A1Cs are high, people experience hypoglycemia, and on and on. And what we know is that adding a second drug to insulin can better improve outcomes. And the one that I'm talking about, which is what Dr. Weber's gonna talk about, is called pramilatide, which went by the commercial name Simulin. So Simulin is actually FDA approved for type one. It lowers A1C, it reduces mealtime blood sugar, it even has beneficial weight loss. Now look at this CGM trace on the right. This is from a JDRF funded study. The gray line, people took insulin alone. The black line, they took pramilatide and insulin. And look at how much flatter the line is when people are taking pramilatide. This is the exact kind of CGM profile that we're always looking for with our therapies. So the question everyone's probably asking is, well, if this drug's FDA approved and it works so well, why isn't everyone taking it? And the answer is that it's very inconvenient. You have to take an injection with every meal and it can't be easily co-formulated with insulin into one syringe or pen or vial, which means that you have to take twice as many injections every day in order to use this drug. Uh, which doesn't work for most people. And so JDRF has a major priority in partnering with academics and the private sector to develop smart co-formulations um, for insulin and pramlintide so that people can take them together and enjoy benefits um, like the CGM trace I just described. Um, in addition to adjunctive therapies, we're also working to make insulins better, either faster or smarter, and you've probably heard of glucose responsive insulins. This is a true JDR flagship program. They're insulins which are on when blood sugar is high, but automatically turn off when it's low to prevent hypoglycemia. And Dr. Weber is gonna tell you much more about these. And on to my last slide, please. So I just wanted to sort of wrap up my little introduction. We're laser focused on finding cures for type one, but are working to improve lives in parallel. Um, we've made enormous progress, and I hope just a couple of the quick results I had time to show you today demonstrate that. And there's still so much more work to do. This picture is of our founding mothers, Lee Ducat and Carol Lurie. Um, JDRF was founded at their, one of their kitchen tables uh, 49 years ago, I believe. And um, besides that, it's the day after Mother's Day. That's just a coincidence, but it really is kind of fitting all the time. Um, I suspect that many of the people on this call are either people with type one or their friends and families. And I just wanna make the quick point that everything we've accomplished at JDRF in the last 49 years is because of the support of people like you dating back to the two moms who decided to do something about this problem. So thank you so much for all that you do for JDRF. And now I'm gonna turn it over um, to Dr. Weber to tell us about some of the really exciting research that he's doing. Um, so I believe I stopped sharing, so you should be able to share. Excellent. And I was muted, so there we are. Now we're unmuted. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, you know, uh, thank you both for for introduction and setting the stage here a little bit of what we're going to talk about um, as far as the research in my own group at the University of Notre Dame. Um, I'm more on the second half of what John talked about, right? We're not as interested in, in or not, I mean, we're interested in cures. We're not working actively on, on cures for type one diabetes. We're working on strategies that make the therapeutics that are out there work better, um, more effective, uh, better management of blood glucose, et cetera. And so um, I use one, one, one uh, phrase on this slide that maybe is foreign to most of you, super molecular chemistry. I promise I will introduce that. Uh, in a few slides. And so if you're presently confused, that's okay. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. 
And so I first wanted to talk about just how blood glucose is managed in a sort of normal, healthy operation, right? And so I have some of my favorite foods here, right? And I'm going to eat these. My gastrointestinal system is going to extract nutrients. And in this case, what we care a lot about is glucose and complex carbohydrates that get broken down into glucose through my GI tract. And this is going to serve to raise my blood glucose level, right? And so maybe if I have that sugary donut, maybe it goes up a little more than, than you know, if I have my, uh, my keto burger, we'll imagine uh, there instead, right? And so blood glucose goes up. Um, in response to blood glucose going up, beta cells, which John alluded to in his, uh, in his, in his introduction, uh, in the pancreas, these cell clusters within the pancreas, secrete hormones such as insulin and amylin. Amylin is the, is the natural form of that pramletide simulin um, that, uh, that, John, that John talked about, right? And so the, the pancreas secretes insulin and amylin in response to this, this blood glucose uh, elevating event of, of having eaten. Uh, the insulin then signals these, the, the skeletal muscle and the liver to take up and store that glucose in its polymerized form. Uh, and this is, you know, so we don't have to eat constantly, right? So that we can have some uh, glucose stored as sort of reserve energy uh, in, uh, in times of need, right? And so maybe you're going to go run a marathon and you're going to carbo load, right? If, you know, the, the science behind that is a little, uh, is, is potentially to be doubted. But, you know, the idea that you could take and you can take glucose, eat it now, and store it for later in this muscle or in the liver tissue as a result of the function of insulin, right? And then, uh, and then sort of at the same time, blood glucose now goes down, right? Because my body is taking that glucose out of the blood as a result of that insulin signaling and storing it for future use. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happens um, in the case of type 1 diabetes, right? I still eat my, my donut, my body still takes the glucose out of that donut and, and puts it into the bloodstream to be used. Um, but now I have uh, either a, a significant lack or very, very dysfunctional beta cell uh, function in my, in my pancreas. And so whereas that increase in blood glucose would have normally produced insulin and amylin, now those signals are absent. I cannot now tell my body to take up and store the blood glucose. Uh, and so my blood glucose remains high, right? And then my emoji now is, is saying that I'm sad, right? My blood glucose is high, it's elevated. Um, this leads to all kinds of, of, of uh, short and long-term complications, uh, increased cardiovascular risk, increased risk of stroke, uh, you know, renal failure, these kinds of things, right? And so the, the major therapeutic uh, revolution in, in treating diabetes has come from uh, the administration of, of insulin, right? So initially, insulin's history is, is harvested from, uh, from pigs, and then it was made recombinantly. And now we'll talk about it, but there's a lot of different variants of insulin that are available that I can take depending on how fast I want the insulin to act, how long I want the insulin to be in my body and acting, right? And so what I would do is, as I'm at, in conjunction with, with having this meal, I would measure my blood glucose, I would sort of estimate, hey, you know, my donut's going to have a, a good amount of sugar in it. I'm going to click my insulin pen a couple of times, and I'm going to give myself, you know, insulin um, in conjunction with this meal so that my body can take up this glucose I'm about to eat or I'm currently eating and, and process it the way it would were my pancreas to be functioning um, as normal, right? And so we take uh, our insulin. The insulin now signals the, blood, the body to take up and store this glucose, and now my blood glucose goes back down in response to this, this insulin signaling. And so I'll, I'll draw your attention to a couple of things. First, this idea that uh, the normal healthy pancreas would be producing both insulin and amylin from these beta cells. Uh, but when I do this therapeutic, I almost always, about 95, 97% of the time, um, I'm only replacing this with insulin, right? So why, am, why are we forgetting about this amylin signal? Well, the amylin signal sort of as John mentioned, is an adjunctive therapy, right? So it acts kind of in addition to insulin, but in and of itself is not uh, crucial. So that's one reason. The other reason is that it's not often, inco it's, it's incompatible in formulation with insulin. And so a person would have to carry around one of these pens for their insulin and one of those pens for their, their amylin, inject both every time. Uh, and, and that turns out to be a little bit uh, cumbersome, a little bit burdensome. Uh, and it's not, often, uh, it's not often adhered to, even in cases where it is prescribed. 
And so this leads to sort of uh, a little conversation about the standard of care in type 1 diabetes. And so as I mentioned, there's many different insulin options available. Uh, some have different onset or duration. So maybe I have very rapid acting insulin that, that I inject and within you know, minutes of injecting it, it's now already making its way into the bloodstream and signaling. Uh, maybe we take some that is acting on the order of you know, half an hour to an hour or two. And then maybe we have some other varieties that are what's known as basal insulin. It's something that maybe you would take one, one shot in the morning and you'd sort of have a, a steady level of insulin available throughout the day as this slowly became available through, through one of a couple of different mechanisms. Um, all of these, and even when they're automated by a pump, um, require somebody to do some monitoring, right? So this is often uh, is familiar through either a continuous glucose monitor, some sort of wearable device that would measure your blood glucose, or commonly also um, through uh, finger pricks and, and blood glucose measurements with a handheld meter. And so this puts a lot of the burden in terms of managing the disease on the individual. Um, it also requires the individual to do dose estimation, right, which leads to inaccuracies. Um, as I mentioned, maybe I, you know, maybe I plan to have a, a little bit bigger lunch, and so I'm going to click my insulin pen an extra time. Maybe I have a little smaller lunch, and so I say, okay, and I'll go one click less. You know, but you're still sort of estimating about how much of a dose you're going to need. And people, you know, diabetics uh, generally get a feel for this, but it's not perfect. Um, and again, these are things people have to self-administer. And so one of the strategies that could potentially make life for diabetics better is this idea of glucose responsive insulin. Um, and this would be the idea that we would make the insulin a little bit smarter, right? We would make the insulin in some way able to have some sort of autonomous sensing of blood glucose. So maybe it's got an activatable switch on it. Maybe it's, it's encased in a material that then its, its properties are, are dependent on blood glucose level. And then the, material, then the insulin itself would then have a dose or a potency or an availability that would be tuned by the blood glucose level. And so if I have a little bit higher blood glucose level, my insulin would be a little bit stronger. Or I'd have a little bit more of it. If my blood glucose is a little bit uh, lower, maybe I don't need as much insulin, but my insulin would then be a little less potent or a little bit less available. All right. So I think this is a high priority target in the area of, of type 1 diabetes um, in part to eliminate some of the error associated with the monitoring step and the dose estimation and the self-administration to put a little bit more of the, the intelligence in the technology itself and, and remove some of the burden of, uh, of, of active management from the individual. And then I think the next step is then to also think about adjunctive therapy, right? And so um, can we think about incorporating synergistic hormones such as, as that amylin signal uh, which John showed has phenomenal improvement in the function of insulin. And we would think maybe it should, right? I think, you know, humans have evolved to process blood glucose by, by secreting both insulin and amylin signals, right? And they, they, have a, they have a synergistic role. And yet when we do therapy, uh, too often, we only administer the insulin. And so this, this native natural signal of the amylin um, is not provided uh, therapeutically, right? And so to really achieve, you know, some of these key clinical benefits to normalize blood glucose uh, a little bit more to prevent some of the, the postprandial glu glucagon secretion and these kinds of things that are, that happen a lot of times with an insulin dose, right? Incorporating the amylin signal would also be, would be a desirable uh, therapeutic route. And so I'm going to take a little step back and I'm going to introduce myself. And so uh, the subtitle of this is uh, why is a chemical engineer working on diabetes, right? Um, as the, the spoiler, I don't have a personal connection to diabetes. I, I do not personally have diabetes. I don't have, you know, family or friends with diabetes. Um, a lot of people in this space work on it for that reason. Um, I don't have a, an interesting personal narrative that connects me uh, to the disease in that in that intimate way, you know, thankfully in, in many in many respects, right? Um, but I am very interested in it as a scientist and as an engineer, as a as a model with which we can build things. And so, um, I grew up uh, in in uh, the state of Utah. I come from a very large uh, Catholic Italian family. 
uh, that was in the sausage industry in Utah. And there's a picture of one of our billboards here. The, the, the nice thing about being in the sausage industry is you don't have to pay a marketing company uh, to develop your advertising slogans, right? It kind of sells itself uh, in certain ways. Um, I then left Utah and I went to college actually here in Indiana, the University of Notre Dame. I got my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. Uh, went just next door to Illinois for my PhD in biomedical engineering, uh, where I worked in the area of supermolecular chemistry and self-assembling materials. And this was primarily a, a based on cardiovascular disease. I was making things that uh, facilitated the growth of blood vessels in, in uh, oxygen-starved tissues. Um, when I was finishing my PhD, I really wanted to go to do a postdoc with Bob Langer's group at MIT. And Bob is sort of the, the founding father of all things uh, drug delivery. And so he is a prolific inventor and has developed a lot of different strategies for delivering drugs and therapeutics. And I really wanted to go and work with Bob and learn a lot more about his model of, of academic uh, research and, and translating that into entrepreneurial activities and these kinds of things. And so when I contacted Bob, he said, oh yeah, we'd love to have you. Um, we just got funding for uh, the area of glucose responsive uh, drug delivery. Would you be interested? And so I hadn't really thought about it until this point, and I really wanted to go work with Bob Langer. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll do whatever. You know, I'll, work, I'll, I'll do any kind of research that, that, uh, that Bob thinks is important. And so this is really kind of how I got involved in this. It wasn't you know, necessarily to, uh, uh, to do diabetes research. Initially, it was that I wanted to go and work with Bob Langer. He had this funding in the area of uh, glucose-responsive insulin. And so I thought, well, this looks like a good opportunity to go and, and work with this, this brilliant scientist at MIT. And so I spent four and a half years working with Bob Langer at MIT. And then um, at some point uh, was recruited back to the University of Notre Dame about going on about four years ago uh, to come here and start my own research group. And so I like to joke uh, that I have two families, right? So this is my family here. We live in, in Northern Indiana. This is my daughter, Adeline. She's almost six. My daughter, Mia, who's almost three. And my wife, Teresa, who's actually also a Notre Dame alum. Um, and then my second family is all of these people here. And so, you know, I, uh, these are sometimes the, the ones that take up a little bit more of my time and are, you know, a little few more mouths to feed over here. But, you know, as an academic and as a researcher, I write grants and I, you know, I, uh, I, I engage in different partnerships with foundations and with industry and other sorts of things in order to be able to employ and, and pay for uh, a research team to come in and work with me on interesting problems. And so grants like we get from the JDRF and from other places really help to, to support this, this personnel and these, the staff that we're able to assemble. And so what do chemical engineers do, right? So we do a lot of different things. Um, but one of the things chemical engineers do is the, a class called process controls. And what you'll learn in process controls is about different ways of doing feedback in a, in a controlled system, right? And so maybe this is to optimize your reactor output. Maybe this is to, uh, to normalize the temperature in some sort of heat exchanger, right? For example, there's a, this, is the, this is the control algorithm for how a clothes dryer works. So one of my, one of my friends, when we graduated with chemical engineering degrees, went to GE to make dryers, right? And so um, he was working on optimizing the, the protocols for, for closed dryers. Um, now, if you look at it kind of, you know, kind of on a coarse, coarse grain sort of uh, perspective, this doesn't look too much different than what the body does when it's controlling blood glucose, right? I have some sort of input, my food, my glucose stimulus. I have some sort of, uh, of, of uh, insulin signal that then is secreted to allow blood glucose to, to kind of renormalize. And I sort of do this uh, iteratively. It's also how we actually do things um, in, a, uh, in the case of disease as well when we try to automate the function of the pancreas. And so this is what biology does, right? In a healthy pancreas, it secretes insulin, which, which signals these cells to take up glucose and store it to maintain some sort of homeostasis. Now, if I don't have enough glucose, my pancreas, different cells in the pancreas, secrete glucagon, uh, which then tells my body to break down that glucose that is just stored in order to maintain homeostasis, right? So the body is doing process controls in a very elegant way, uh, rather than with computers and PID controllers and the kinds of things a chemical engineer might do. It's doing it with cells and tissues and hormones and these kinds of things. Now, when we try to automate this, we kind of do a hybrid approach, right? We have my PID controller that's going to measure uh, blood glucose, and it's going to tell my pump how much insulin to give or how much glucagon to give in order to maintain some sort of homeostasis. But this is sort of how a chemical engineer thinks about 
about insulin is as a process control problem, as, a, as the you know, sort of sensing and responding. And so even under this situation of very you know, idealized control, uh, this is some closed loop data from a New England Journal of Medicine study, and this was a dual pump, uh, a dual hormone pump. And so it was uh, a, group, a cohort of patients that were wearing um, an insulin pump and a glucagon pump and a CGM and then some sort of algorithm. And so the algorithm would continuously measure blood glucose. If blood glucose was a little high, it would give a little insulin. If it was a little low, it would give a little glucagon. And the idea was to sort of keep people in this, in this range. And you see people are mostly in sort of the, you know, green to bluish range maybe. Uh, but there are still some excursions, right? The, the so-called, um, you know, either hyperglycemic excursions or the hypoglycemic excursions. And so even under an optimized control scenario, uh, there, are, uh, there are blood glucose excursions that have health complications, right? And so maybe if I'm a little bit high, you know, I could have... Uh, you know, over a long time, I could, I could have some, some serious health complications. I mentioned, you know, cardiovascular disease, kidney failure, blindness, uh, some neuropathies, different things like that. Uh, but they can have some acute complications. But the one that really scares people often is the, the low um, uh, uh, hypoglycemia, right? When blood glucose gets too low, uh, this, can, this can be a, a lethal event, you know, very, very quickly, right? And so, even under an optimized control scenario, insulin and, and glucagon um, are unable to prevent, you know, blood glucose from even creeping a little bit low. And so I think what this tells us is that the therapeutics themselves uh, still have room for improvement, still could be engineered a little bit better. And so this is where sort of we've, we've taken off and tried to think about ways of applying uh, different chemistry to the design and the delivery of the therapeutic entities themselves. And so uh, John gave a nice introduction into ways we could think about improving glycemic control. I could think about maybe replacing the cells that produce uh, insulin. So a beta cell transplant or a, a cell originating from some stem cell that has been differentiated into a beta or beta-like cell um, and figuring out a way to deliver this and protect it from the body's immune system such that I could have this glucose sensing insulin secreting functionality. Um, I could think about what we kind of uh, affectionately um, call the bionic pancreas. So this is uh, where that, that uh, glucose trace from the previous slide came from. This idea that I would wear a CGM, I'd wear some sort of pump, I'd have some sort of, what you don't see is that this, uh, this x-ray man here has a, a, a smartphone in his pocket that's now integrating all of these signals and helping all of these devices communicate, right? But we have now a fully synthetic inter uh, interface of computer parts and uh, pumps and things like that that can replace the function of a pancreas and, and sort of seek control. And the third way, and this is the way that we like to think about insulin and, and, uh, and diabetes therapy, is in, in the idea of smart drug delivery, right? So uh, we've, we've termed this over the years, uh, the fully synthetic pancreas. So can I make the insulin hormones smarter, right? Can I put some sort of glucose activatable switch on it such that even if I give myself a little too much, it doesn't really matter because it's inactive unless the blood glucose is above a certain threshold. Um, or can I make a material that swells to release insulin as a function of, of blood glucose level? And so there's been um, some different strategies and even a, a company that uh, was, was acquired within you know, the last decade or so to, to look at different strategies for glucose responsive delivery from a material. Right? And so this is the kinds of things we think about doing, is doing closed loop control in a fully synthetic uh, uh, context. Right? So can I do, can I do closed, loop gluco closed loop blood glucose control uh, just by engineering the parts and pieces of the therapy to actually be able to do the autonomous sensing of blood glucose and the tuning of the therapeutic uh, made available. And so I think this is really where the future of, of what we're thinking about uh, responsive drug delivery and diabetes is going. Um, certainly knowing that the, the present delay, which is exhibited by a lot of these insulin releasing strategies right now is undesirable, right? If I've got to wait an hour before my material swells to release insulin, this is not good enough, right? So making these things faster is important. Um, these materials then, you know, if I have a material that swells to release insulin, well, oftentimes it doesn't de-swell fast enough to prevent 
uh, extra release, right? And so delayed shutoff in this material um, is a huge problem given what I've mentioned of the, the severe risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, and then if this is gonna leak insulin or uh, make it available when it's not needed, this could also potentially be uh, dangerous or even lethal, right? So it's got to really hold the insulin in. So it's got to hold it in really well. It's got to turn on really fast and it's got to turn off really fast, right? So that's sort of a way to think about blood glucose uh, response in, a, in an insulin delivery material. Um, we have to then ensure the compatibility of any material or modification we're going to use, right? This gets into a safety, right? So if I'm going to modify the insulin protein itself, I've got to make sure this is safe, that it doesn't elicit an immune response especially something like insulin, raising an immune response against that, that protein would be, would be disastrous, right? Because this is something people administer multiple times a day for a lifetime. Um, any material I use um, has to be amenable to lay-centered modes of administration. So if I've, got a, if I've got to make a surgical incision and implant a device every time I want to change out my insulin uh, cartridge, uh, this is probably not, uh, not going to be feasible, right? So something that's easily injectable. Uh, we tend to think about if we're going to make a material, it should still be usable uh, in the same sort of auto injector pen platform that, a, that a, a, a person would be otherwise used to using in the context of their normal insulin therapy. And anything we use has to be tolerated, like I said, for a lifetime of use, be it the material or the modified protein. And then I think even moving forward in drug delivery for diabetes, can we advance towards bio-inspired insulin therapeutics? Right, and so I mentioned that the beta cell secretes this insulin and amylin uh, when responding to a glucose uh, stimulus, right? So maybe we should be thinking more about co-delivering these two hormones in the way the pancreas would normally. Uh, in the first, when the pancreas releases insulin, the first place it hits is the liver. Uh, and this is actually one of the major stores of glucose in the, in the body for reserve energy. Yet when I administer my... Uh, my insulin subcutaneously through, a, through an injection, it doesn't go to the liver first, right? It goes, to the, it goes to the whole body. And so maybe we could think about making insulin delivered a little bit better so that it delivers more like uh, natural insulin would and kind of hits the liver preferentially. Uh, and then thinking about even the abiologic, biologic integration, right? Can we start to, can we start to make uh, synthetic systems that do a better job sensing blood glucose, sensing markers of of uh, elevated states or low states and then responding in kind. And so perfect glycemic management, um, I think is really still uh, uh, on the horizon for, for this idea of a fully synthetic pancreas. Uh, and these are just the challenges for insulin, right? And so I would point out the delivery of related hormones, glucagon and amylin in the space of, of responsive materials is actually almost completely unexplored. And so my group has really been working on all of these things in the last few years. We've been working on better ways to make materials or modifications that can sense glucose. We've been working on better formulation strategies so that we can formulate glucose and, and amylin and related hormones. And we actually have an arm of our group also that's working in the area of uh, glucagon formulation and delivery. And so I promised at the outset that I would explain this term supramolecular chemistry. And so I'll, I'll do so here just briefly because this is what we use. This is our toolbox that we like to think about uh, in the context of, uh, of building materials that can, that can function in the body or can sense blood glucose or engage uh, through some sort of responsive function. So this is chemistry beyond the molecule. So if you took uh, gen chem class or some sort of chemistry class in high school or in college, you learn that atoms are connected by bonds and this forms molecules, right? Well, this particular branch of chemistry does things a little bit different. It organizes atoms and molecules without the need for covalently connecting them, right? So I could make a molecule that looks like a basket and I could make another molecule that looks like a, an apple, right? And my apple goes and it sits in this basket, right? Something like this little motif here. Right, I can make a molecule that looks like a, like a shoelace and something that looks kind of like the, the eye of a, of, a, you know, of a shoe. And then you, you take the lace, you, you thread this thing, and now I get function like this. Or I could make things that like to stack on top of each other and form interesting assemblies, right? And so in my lifetime, uh, there's been a couple of Nobel Prizes awarded uh, for this concept of, uh, of organization of molecules without the need uh, for covalent bonds. Um, and uh, so this has been a field that I've been thinking about how we can actually take this and apply it 
in the context of making new therapeutic materials. And so if I don't have to be restricted to designing molecules and materials with covalent bonds, um, I can realize a lot of very interesting properties that are going to improve therapeutics. And so one of these being, if I have things that can just recognize each other and do so dynamically, um, these interactions are now governed by thermodynamics. Uh, now I can have things that, that bind and unbind, and I can calculate time scales at which things remain bound, but they're very dynamic. Right? I can start to play with all the building blocks, and I can make very tunable systems. I can change uh, the, p the parts and pieces that I put together to make my material and make it more... Uh, more tunable, more amenable to modification. Um, I can start to think about making things that are modular or maybe more person specific, right? Um, oh, oh, recognizing that your disease is different than someone else's disease and kind of a one size fits all therapeutic design uh, maybe isn't the best strategy. Uh, by not having covalent bonds attaching different parts of molecules, now I can, I can more rapidly sense and respond to environmental cues. And so in the field of glucose responsive materials uh, for insulin delivery, oftentimes they relied on very, very slow uh, rupture of bonds in long polymers and plastics and things like that in order to release insulin. This is very slow. If I have interactions that happen very fast and very dynamically, in principle, I can also make them uh, separate very quickly to, to enable release of some encapsulated drug. Uh, and then, like I said, thinking about ways of, of engaging bioregulated feedback mechanisms in materials. So can I have real-time sensing of my disease state, in this case, blood glucose, and then uh, respond with by addressing the therapeutic need? And so um, dynamic covalent sensing, this is one type of, of supramolecular chemistry. Uh, on that slide of the... Uh, the Nobel Prize winners, the middle picture on the top row is a Frenchman named Jean-Marie Len, and I had breakfast with him last summer in uh, Switzerland. He's like 87, 88 years old, still active, still researching, still going to conferences. And so I had breakfast with him and he said, our field needs to be thinking more about dynamic covalent bonds and what we can do to actually you know, achieve function with these things. And so, so this is one example, right? This is uh, this is a, uh, a, a chemical motif known as phenyl boronic acid. Um, what's special about this is it binds to molecules that look like this, diols, right? Molecules with two alcohols, of which glucose is one, right? And we can control this. This is all reversible. Like I said, these are dynamic interactions. They can break and reform and break and reform. And I can control it based on pH. I can control it based on how I, uh, what I do to this ring structure. And so this was one of the first places we wanted to start looking. And so um, when I was with, with Bob Langer, I worked with uh, another friend of mine, Danny Cho, um, who's also a JDRF-funded investigator. Uh, and uh, we developed a strategy to put uh, switches, these phenylbronic acid switches on insulin. And this can bind glucose and change the properties of the insulin. And so in a diabetic mouse, we would take this, we would inject uh, our insulin at time zero, call it, this is a very, very diabetic mouse. If you're accustomed to, to monitoring blood glucose, you know that 400 milligrams per deciliter is, is quite high, right? We'd normally want to see something in like the 80 to 100 range for a, a fasted state. Um, and so these mice are very, very diabetic. We inject our, ins our insulins here. Blood glucose goes down, as you'd expect. The black is just native unmodified insulin. And then these different colors are different modifications we've made on the insulin. Four hours after we've administered insulin, we decide, well, it's time for mouse breakfast. And so we administer a glucose challenge to these mice. No insulin, just a glucose challenge. Blood glucose goes up and in many cases comes back down, as you'd expect, as the pancreas would do. Right? We decide now, we're now seven hours after we've administered glucose. Well, now it's time for mouse lunch. Blood glucose goes up, comes back down. Now here we are 10 hours after these mice have had insulin. We say, okay, it's time for mouse dinner. Blood glucose goes up. And in the case of this particular one, this is a, one of the modifications to this ring. It comes back down, right? And so this is just an example of an insulin that you could take potentially in the morning one time. It could just be on board and circulating in your body at a reduced potency. And as you experience glucose throughout the day, the insulin could become available and actually tune its activity as a function of, of your need. We've also used this aryl boronate strategy to make responsive hydrogels, and this is kind of important in the context of the, the JDRF project I'll introduce here uh, that, we're, that we're working on as of you know, a couple months ago. And, and so you can use this phenylbronic acid 
uh, dial interaction to make a network. Or you can think about this like a mesh or a net structure. Uh, and you can put proteins inside of this, this mesh. And then as these bonds break, as free glucose comes in and competes for these bonds, now my therapeutic could be released. Right? And so the interesting thing about this is we were able to make glucose responsive releasing materials. We couldn't do so for molecules as small as insulin. We needed to use actually bigger uh, proteins to be able to get glucose responsive release. And so this is one challenge we actually hope to address with our, our present technology. Another type of chemistry that we do and will be will kind of uh, crucial to our, our JDRF project that we're starting uh, is macrocyclic host guest chemistry. And so this is the recognition of a small molecule guest inside of the portal of a, of a host molecule. So this is kind of like that basket and apple uh, analogy that I made earlier. And so I got excited about this during my postdoc because of this, of one particular macrocycle's ability to recognize uh, a native residue on insulin and bind to it. And so we realized that we could actually take the insulin protein, we could bind this residue, and we could endow the insulin with uh, some sort of function. All right, and this is non-covalent. So we're not modifying the insulin protein at all. This is just native human insulin. And we take this, we modify it. Now we can change its properties. And so the first thing we did was we wanted to show that we could prevent its aggregation, right? So normal insulin in a vial or in a pump or in a cartridge or something like that will aggregate. It'll form uh, this, this precipitate. Um, and that's not good. It, you know, it, uh, it, it can be immunogenic. It clogs the, the lines of these pumps. It has all kinds of, of, uh, of complications, right? And so when we do this, when we take the insulin and we modify it without the need for covalent bonds, right? We can take the insulin and we can go from what would normally aggregate on the order of 10 to 12 hours to something that is stable even out to 100 days remains active. And even uh, we were able to show this even one step further in taking this, this modification here and enabling co-formulation of, of insulin and pramlatide. And so John mentioned that the co-formulation of this is a huge challenge, right? I mentioned this as well, why more people don't take this. They don't want to carry around two pens with them. Well, we were able to show now that we can take this and we can actually solubilize these and put these in the same pen. And this is data from diabetic pigs, uh, where we show that the administration of this co-formulation actually leads to significant overlap in the pharmacokinetic uh, profiles of these two things. So these, these hormones, insulin and pramlatide, are being made available at the same time, the same way they would be for my, my healthy beta cell. And so this is sort of a more biomimetic uh, approach. And this actually just published online today in uh, Nature BME. So this is sort of hot off the press, I suppose. And so this is another example of how chemistry could be used to change and improve insulin therapeutics. And I'll just point out actually that this particular project, this idea of non-covalent modification of insulin, uh, we're now working in collaboration to commercialize this technology with uh, the kind of venture arm of JDRF. It's called the T1D Fund. And this is a, a philanthropic, philanthropic group that actually works to advance technology's key for, for uh, type 1 diabetes. And so this all gets us now by a very, very long introduction to the very short um, uh, portion about our actual project for this JDRF grant. Um, to developing new materials for glucose responsive insulin and then also you know, incorporating pramlatide so we can have this dual hormone signal. And so this is a grant that was active, we started March of this year. Uh, and so my lab was open for exactly three weeks from the start date of this grant until the, uh, the COVID related closures. And so we're looking forward to really getting back and ramping things up here pretty soon. Um, but the general objective of this grant, the, the goals that we're try setting, setting out to try to achieve are trying to prepare materials that combine insulin affinity with glucose sensing for some sort of improved autonomous and biomimetic uh, glucose control. And so can we combine these two things? Can we combine the glucose sensing of this aeroborinate chemistry that we talked about with the insulin affinity here? So we can use the glucose sensing plus insulin affinity to enable safety, to enable better, device, better uh, hydrogel or material uh, binding of insulin um, in the, uh, to prevent this leakage, to prevent some of the other issues that happen. And so very fast on off with, with safe uh, uh, properties is what we would kind of target. And so to give you sort of an introduction, my group is now making thermoresponsive hydrogels, right? So gels we can put into a pen, we can inject these through a little tiny needle, and they would form a solid material under the skin in the body. To give you an idea what this looks like at 23 degrees, I inject this. It's just a viscous blue liquid, right? We put a little dye in there so you can see it. But if I inject this at 37 degrees, the temperature of my body, 
you don't have to believe me until the stir bar starts hitting this thing, but this is a solid gel, All right? So this thing could actually be easily injected as a low viscosity liquid and become solid in the body. And so our thought is, can we use this type of gel? Well, this is, I guess, just to, sorry, just to show you the gels are safe. They're, there's minimal immune response. They clear over a time that we can kind of uh, dictate and, and control through the design of the material. So this is our thinking is, can we take this thermoresponsive hydrogel backbone, incorporate my groups for insulin affinity, and then now incorporate this chemistry for glucose sensing. And then we can use this glucose diol crosslinking to make these very dense materials that form only in the body, so they're easily injected, and which have uh, formation uh, mechanisms that are glucose dictated. So at higher glucose, these crosslinks between the red and the blue piece here break, and now my gel falls apart and my, my insulin can come out. Um, but only a little bit can come out because I've still got the affinity presented uh, to be able to bind some of it. And because we're now using this, this, uh, this PEG-CB component here, we can also now uh, co-formulate both insulin and pramlutide. And so in the three or so weeks that we got started on this project, we worked on actually making some of these glucose sensors uh, for the polymer backbone. And we've also now worked on making the diol component. And just you know, the day or two before the lab closed down, we were able to show that we can get this thermoresponsive uh, hydrogels that we, we would want, uh, where we have a low viscosity liquid at room temperature, but as soon as I put it into the body, I get a nice solid uh, gel that defies gravity and hangs up here. And so I'm not, I think maybe I went a couple minutes longer than requested, I apologize. Um, but uh, I just wanna thank you for your support of JDRF. Thank JDRF, of course, for this award that we're really excited to, to get to work on for the next five years. Uh, this is my team. They do all the work. I just get to come and talk to people and have fun. Um, and then, of course, some other funders that fund some other aspects of our, of our team as well. And so I'd be happy to take any questions or, you know, answer anything that has it may, uh, you know, whatever the, uh, the moderators would, would think would be appropriate. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, that was really fascinating. Um, I would like to yeah, just echo that. Um, if you would like to um, ask questions of either John or Matt, um, please feel free to unmute yourself at this time. Uh, feel free, if you are on video, to uh, add yourself on video to ask your questions, and we'll take um, a couple minutes here and certainly give you all a chance to ask some um, some questions. But um, really fascinating stuff. I'll, I have a, maybe a question or two, but I'm going to <laughs> maybe uh, give uh, give our audience uh, an opportunity to, to kick us off. So please, anyone feel free to jump in. Okay. Well, well, maybe maybe I can add also, you know, if you if you do have questions or there's things you'd like to discuss, um, at the bottom of each of these slides is my email. You know, feel free to contact me. Feel free to you can give me a call. I'm happy to set up a, a phone call if it's easier to uh, to to discuss some of these things in in the future as well. So, Polina in the chat added, uh, "Thank you very much for the research." Oh, thank thank um, you for the support. We love doing uh, research. So. May I ask you a question real quick, though? Yes. Surely, please go ahead. Yeah, I wonder when such research can be uh, uh, brought to life. Uh, I have T1D. Mm -hmm. uh, I am 67 right now, but um, I was diagnosed as a result of my um, endocrine system failure when I was 62. And one and a half year after I was diagnosed, my grandson was diagnosed as well with T1D. So my question is, uh, when this dual um, system uh, treatment can come to life to help all of us, and especially the kids? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. And that's one I get asked a lot when I do these types of things. I've done some podcast interviews and whatever. And, and so I have, I have sort of two answers to that. I, I, I like to maintain hope, right? Because I think the research we're doing is, you know, is advancing towards uh, a better horizon for therapeutics. 
but then also there's some sort of the realistic framing of this that it's it does take some time right and it takes time for for good reasons and that we want to make sure that what we're going to do is going to be safe that it's going to be actually effective um, that it's going to be better than than what uh, what else is out there um, and the the US FDA for example does an excellent job of of, of putting a lot of uh, kind of waypoints and you know and you know and, and staging the development of these drugs and to, to uh, to sort of make sure that you know safety and uh, regulatory you know approval and things like that actually are, are there's due diligence in that process. So how long is it going to take? Well, it kind of depends on the the product. It depends on the target. It depends on the population it's intended to treat. Um, but it's not uh, you know it's it's closer to you know a decade or more than it is to a year, if that gives you some sort of I guess. Uh, um, answer on a timeline. You know, the co-formulation stuff we're looking at, um, we like that idea, but that idea would be a new drug, right? And so we'd have to actually, uh, you know, go through all of the process of showing that this thing is is safe and well tolerated and these kinds of things. Um, some other things, maybe if we could get away with not changing the insulin at all, um, it might be a little bit uh, faster, just because the insulin itself has already been shown to be safe, and we're just working on the device side of things. So. John, I don't, you probably have more experience with that as well, John. So if you have more to add. Yeah, I, I was just going to add one point. I just wanted to let everyone know that um, JDRF supports a, a broad portfolio of drugs and devices, and it's a diversified portfolio. And some of it is fairly ambitious, more long-term projects like the one you just heard about. And at the same time, we support projects which are further along in development to start with and are more likely to make it into patients' hands um, in the next several years instead of more like 10 years. Thank you yeah. very much. I think that's fair. Ideally, you know, every, you know, every advancement helps, right? And so, you know, what's happening in two years will make things better. And then the stuff that's in the pipeline, you know, that's less far, far along, maybe makes things even better, you know, years after that. So kind of the, ideally the care, you know, care and treatment evolves and improves with each iteration. Thank you so much. We'll wait to see that <laughs> in life. Thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, another question from um, uh, any of our participants that they'd like to ask. Well, I'll, I'll sneak in mine, I guess. Um, I, I guess when I, I had always imagined that as kind of that switch type thing with like the, the hydrogel where um, it senses the glucose, right, and gets switched on. I, I had never kind of heard the, the swelling kind of idea for, for how to, to, to make that work. So would you say one is looking more promising than the other? You obviously talked about how some of the issues with kind of the swelling in terms of, of um, uh, of noticing and, and being reactive to the amount of it, um, uh, glucose in the, the blood. Um, part of the issue was it doesn't de-swell in time. So um, I was just curious if one seems more promising at this time. You know, I don't, I think that they're maybe not even uh, two independent directions. I think that they can kind of, you know, parts and pieces of, you know, of each, whether it's a switch and then also a, you know, a swelling mechanism or a degradation mechanism or an erosion mechanism. I think there's a lot of different mechanisms in the material. Um, I'm not certain one's more promising than the other. I think, you know, I think we have sort of the, the target uh, uh, kind of metrics we'd like to meet, right? We want something that's going to turn on fast. What does fast mean? Well, you know, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, is it releasing insulin as blood glucose is going up versus four hours after blood glucose went up, right? Is it going to turn off right away? Is it going to turn off when blood glucose crosses, you know, 110 milligrams per deciliter? Or is it going to sort of lag in its release? And so um, I think more what we'll look for is the metrics of the material itself, less like the, you know, the particular mechanism that we get released or that we, we halt release, I think, is less important than the, the actual performance. I don't know if that really answers your question. I think that, you know, they both, you know, sort of different versions of this, I think, have different benefits. So. No, that makes a makes a lot of sense. Uh, 
we have time for maybe one uh, one more question, and then uh, certainly want to give you guys time for the rest of your evening. So, um, see if any other participants have a question. All right. Well, hearing none, um, I know from my perspective, that was very thorough from both of you. So I think um, maybe that that's uh, almost, uh, I think, uh, indicative of how, how thorough you were in explaining your research, uh, Matt. Certainly appreciate you walking us through the important uh, steps that you and your team are undertaking. I know for uh, JDRF Indiana, we're really excited to see, you know, once, once we get past this, you know, current state of things within our state and our, our country and you guys are able to, to fully work. We're uh, excited to see how your research goes uh, moving forward. And John, thank you so much for, for giving that greater context as well. So um, any last thoughts before we kind of sign off here tonight? You know, I think I would just close by just applauding, you know, the JDRF for their continued dedication and focus on, on type one diabetes. I think that, um, there's, you know, it's, it's challenging kind of being on the other side of this now thinking about, you know, how do we commercialize some of these technologies, the, the, the co-formulation thing. Um, without support like, JD, like JDRF is willing to provide, some of these technologies may not uh, be able to advance just because uh, there may not be a market for them, right? And, or the market is very type 2 specific. And so to the extent that which, which type 1 technologies fit into the type 2 umbrella, you know, then maybe they still have a chance. And so I think that the JDRF's focus on type one is certainly very, very important and very appreciated. Um, and it's something that I think uh, I would just like to applaud. I think that, you know, that, that it's, a f it's a phenomenal organization um, and really uh, has really been instrumental in sort of framing my thoughts in this space for, for several years now, so. Yeah. Um... Thank you. Thank you for the shout out, Matt. Um, I don't really have anything to add, uh, except uh, thank you, Sean, for putting the event together. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you all so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your evenings. And again, this recording will be available um, down the road. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank Thanks. you. You too. Thank you, everyone.